Okay kids, what we will do today is we will do the story titled To Build a Fire by Jack London. I want you to go through the story at least thrice. Uh, it's a bit difficult but then I'm sure if you, if you, if you read it uh, thrice then uh, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll get a grip on the story. And uh, to begin with, this is the flow of today's lesson and uh, I will start with the context, the historical context of this particular story. So just remember that uh, in, the, in August 1896, uh, a few miners found uh, a vein of gold in the Klondike region, uh, after which uh, uh, a lot of uh, people in that area, they staked claims to the land, different, different parcels of the land, uh, thinking that gold was beneath the surface of uh, uh, that area okay and then uh, since this uh, particular territory is very far away from mainland america uh, so the americans they weren't aware that uh, uh, gold was present in the region of klondike and it was after a year when steamships traveled to uh, the city of san francisco in america uh, with uh, 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 gold uh, with with prospectors on board uh, as well as uh, they also had a lot of gold on both the ships that uh, news spread like wildfire in san francisco and a lot of common folks a lot of common people they made a beeline to the klondike region okay in search of gold and uh, not only from St. Francisco, but a lot of people from Seattle as well, they ventured out, uh, to they ventured towards this unforgiving landscape in order to make a fortune. Uh, not many were uh, successful, uh, some, a few made their fortunes, but uh, many uh, uh, had to return uh, unsuccessfully. Many died on the way, and the the the, the living the, the first of all the journey itself was very very difficult, and plus the terrain or the landscape uh, of the Klondike was unmerciful and unforgiving. Okay, and uh, so Jack London too, at the age of when he was 21 years old, he too went to the Klondike region in order to make a fortune. Unfortunately, uh, he didn't quite. Uh, uh, as in fine gold and he returned to America uh, disappointed no doubt however he did uh, he did he did learn a lot from his experiences and he mined the ex his experiences in this region to 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 craft uh, stories which uh, went on to uh, make him a literary uh, to make him a star uh, in the literary firmament or literary sky okay so remember that jack so so jack london has based a lot of his uh, novels like the call of the wild white fang a uh, lot of the setting of these novels is in the klondike region and plus a lot of his short stories are uh, similarly based on the uh, based in the Klondike region. Okay, so just do remember that. And uh, as I mentioned on the board, the public. When was this particular story published? This particular story was published in the year 1908 in Century Magazine. And this particular story is also considered one of Jack London's finest story. And it, uh, in no one's, it definitely is an American classic. Okay, now the source of this particular story, as I've already mentioned, is Jack Lennon based this particular story on his own experiences, on his own travels in the harsh, uh, forbidding environment, cold environment of uh, Alaska and Canada. Okay, so it was based on his own travels. So let's say it was based on his own travels and experiences remember that and he also took uh, he also referred to this book by jeremiah lynch j-e-r-e-m-i-a-h jeremiah l-y-n-c-h lynch wrote a book titled three years in the klondike okay so Two sources he based it on his uh, so this story has been crafted uh, keeping in mind his own travels and experiences in the Klondike region and he also 
he also uh, referred to this book by Jeremiah Lynch titled three years in the Klondike so please do remember that okay now the point of view okay the point of view from which this particular story is told the perspective from which the story is told is third person om n-i-s-c-i-e omniscient narrator so what exactly do you mean by third person omniscient narrator it's very very simple uh, he refers to the okay so this so the third person omniscient narrator is simple the narrator is placed outside the story okay and he refers to the characters in third person he uses uh, the pronoun he a pronoun it the man etc and plus uh, look at the word omniscient omniscient means all knowing okay so this narrator knows and tells us not only the behavior of the characters involved in the story but also their thinking how is it that they think so this particular story has the point of view of the story is third person omniscient narrator so please do remember that okay and as far as the setting is concerned the setting of this particular story is the icy cold wilderness of the Yukon territory in Canada and one thing that you need to remember about this particular story is the first page itself the first part itself is that this particular the description of the setting gives us uh, a, an inkling gives us an idea of the vast expanse okay of this landscape against which the main character the protagonist is placed he's just like a minute dot a, a, a speck okay in this vast unforgiving immense landscape of undulating white so do remember that and the other reason why the setting is important is in this particular story it is the setting that furthers the plot kits and the setting is the antagonist the setting is the antagonist in this story okay and from the inception itself the start of the story itself we uh, we 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 the 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 the, the thematic element of man versus nature is established and uh, the first part itself and throughout the story if you read the story carefully kids okay there are several instances of foreshadowing that gives the reader an idea about how the story will play itself out okay for example if you if you read the first if you if you if you read that first page itself he talks about an intangible pall over the face of things which makes the day dark very dark so and plus it was plus remember that the man takes a detour he takes a side trail when he takes a detour from the main yukon trail okay the reason why he takes a detour is because he wants to collect logs of wood from the islands of spruce trees that lie okay in that area so so the setting is very very important okay and the setting is the antagonist remember that and uh, also you get instances of foreshadowing in the setting itself okay and uh, the thematic element established and uh, one of the themes established in the beginning itself and what is the theme well the theme is man versus nature one of perhaps one of the oldest themes in literature so do remember that okay now let's talk about the characters okay so i will take it one step at a time so uh, there are two main characters out here one is a man okay or let's say we call him the man so now why is it that this particular man if you read the story one interesting thing that you will uh, you you you, I think you might ask yourself the question why is it that the man has not been given a name well the man has not been deliberately given a name because this particular story has been written in the naturalistic tradition and i will talk about that later okay but the man has not been given a name because the man represents humanity the man represents every man the man represents perhaps humanity pitted against the unforgiving immeasurable powerful forces of nature so remember that and another thing interesting thing about this particular man is the man is in that particular area okay fine so he starts off so the 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 story opens on a cold winter morning it's nine o'clock in the morning and his destination is the old fork at henderson creek where his friends are waiting for him so he has to make a nine hour trek all the way to reach his destination in that unforgiving unmerciful landscape okay and he's a checker 
this particular word has been used, which is uh, Chinook uh, jargon word, and Chekako means a newcomer. So he is a newcomer, number one. He's a newcomer in that particular area, okay? Uh, so it establishes, clearly establishes the fact that uh, though he has faced, uh, if you read the story, he has faced a lot of, uh, he has faced two or three cold winters, but in, it was his first time in that particular area. And so there was, so, so there is this element of inexperience, number one. Number two is the writer, uh, sorry, the narrator clearly establishes the fact that this man lacks something. And what does the man lack? He the man lacks imagination. Now, what exactly do you mean by the man lacking imagination? Okay, so he was quick and alert on the things of life, but not in their significances, quote unquote. So do remember that point. So what exactly do you mean by the fact that the man lacks imagination in the sense, the man is competent, no doubt, the man is resourceful, no doubt, but the, 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 the clues that he gets that it's very cold does not make him, make him think about the consequences or the outcome of the intense uh, cold. Okay, so he does not think about uh, human frailty or human weakness in the sense that as human beings, we cannot tolerate extremes of temperature. Uh, as in we cannot tolerate, a body finds it very difficult to tolerate if it gets very, very hot. And if it gets exceedingly cold, uh, even uh, that is something that we find difficult to uh, manage, difficult to tolerate. And uh, he is really, really confident in his ability to reason. Okay, so he, he has faith in his rational judgment and he feels that he is properly, he is, as in he's wearing warm clothes, he's got moccasins, he's got mittens in his hands, he's got ear flaps. So, so he is, uh, so he thinks that he is, um, uh, he's attired for the trek. Okay, and plus he's got, um, let's say a watch, he's got matches, he's chewing tobacco, and, and he's also got lunch with him. So he feels that these things are adequate for him to see him through till his destination. See him through to his destination. Okay, so, uh, so, and, uh, so this man is kind of, you also get the sense of this man having a, uh, a certain amount of pride, a certain amount of confidence in himself. And uh, he just fails to understand uh, the consequences of traveling in that particular region uh, in such cold temperatures, okay, as in the, what uh, that, that, that's the, the, he, he fails to understand, he fails to think ahead and perhaps tell himself that, okay, this particular cold climate could end up taking his life. So, so this, this, this fact of this man lacking imagination or, or lacking the ability to think about the outcome established early on in this particular story. Okay, and uh, even when you read the story, okay, there are several instances, kids, okay, when the man gets clues that it's exceedingly cold. He's under the impression. So, uh, remember this part where uh, the spittle, his spittle, okay, cracks midday before it hits the ground. So, when, he, when, 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 when that happens, he has an idea, he has an inkling that, yes, it is really very, 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 very cold. However, uh, he's under the impression that it's probably minus 50 degrees, but in reality, and that's what we readers know, the narrator tells us that it's actually 70, uh, less than 75 degrees. It's 75 degrees below zero. So it is definitely exceedingly cold. And his, uh, uh, so throughout the story, uh, especially the first half of the story, he gets clues that it's exceedingly cold. And plus the, uh, the, the narrator constantly repeats the fact that it's cold, it's cold, it's cold, it's cold, it's cold, it's cold. It's cold. And and if you actually mark or number the instances where the word cold has been repeated, in fact, at the beginning of the story, the partic this particular story starts off with him traveling on a cold morning and this particular ends with this particular man dying. Okay, after a series of mishaps, this particular man dies, okay, under, under the cold sky. Okay, so, so, so there's a lot more, but let's keep it at this. Okay, and now there's another character. So remember, he's all, uh, 
uh, he's not exactly alone in the sense uh, he does not have a human mate with him, a human partner with him. Okay, but he definitely has. Uh, he sorry, not definitely has, but he has a husky, uh, a, a dog that uh, is a close is the close cousin of the wolf. He has a husky with him to give him company. So there is a, another dog in this particular story. Now this particular dog is. Uh, is instinctual okay uh, it, it it is driven by instinct and not only the uh, not only is it driven by in instinct but it has a healthy respect and understanding of the the, the, the really cold temperatures around it okay it uh, so and it 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 it, it is the, the the cold depresses the dog okay and it uh, not through knowledge but its instinct tells it that it is very very um, uh, it is not the right thing to be traveling uh, in such freezing temperatures so this particular dog is you could call it a foil to the man foil in the sense okay oh, so the dog is here the man is here so their natures are contrasted so let's say this is the dog this is the man the natures are contrasted to highlight or to emphasize the characteristics of each other okay so the dog is all about instinct it's not only just remember that it's not only uh, uh, the dog is not only uh, all about instinct but also the dog's body is such that it is insulated from the cold and the man is all about rational judgment and reason okay okay and let's also explore kids the relationship between the dog and the man okay so the, now the dog and the man they're not exactly like i mean to say we have this notion that okay dogs are uh, mankind's best friend a man's best friend and okay uh, dogs are loyal creatures and uh, okay we we uh, human beings uh, in general are very close to dogs we share a close emotional bond with dogs okay but here the way the narrator has spoken about the dog one clearly figures out that the two of them don't share a close relationship okay the reason why the dog listens to the man is because the man to him to the dog sorry not to him, okay you can call it you can you can use him as well or you can use, okay no problem so uh, in the sense uh, the dog listens to the man kids because uh, 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 the man is a provider of, uh, of 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 fire and warmth to the dog and plus the man uh, whips the dog in case of the dog's disobedience and whenever the man speaks to the dog okay there is the threat of whiplashes in his voice so these are the only reasons why the dog kind of listens to him and the dog is not really bothered about the fate of the man and despite knowing uh, as in how um, forbidding the temperature is it does not make any effort to indicate to the man that uh, one should not be traveling in such freezing temperatures okay fine and uh, the dog is uh, okay uh, the dog uh, is completely driven by instinct now um, do we get uh, instance like uh, are there instances uh, uh, showing that in the story yes uh, so there comes a uh, there comes a point wherein the, the so there are these hidden springs beneath uh, or hidden pools of water beneath uh, the surface of ice and the man knows that those hidden springs or hidden pools of water they spell this uh, they spell uh, they, they, uh, so they spell danger okay so they are, can be dangerous so the man he pushes the dog he comes to a particular spot and he feels that there are hidden springs out there and he pushes the dog the dog unwillingly moves ahead breaks through the ice and it ends up wetting its paws now when it ends up wetting its paws or its four legs and hind legs at that point of time the dog driven by instinct okay it starts uh, first trying to lick off the ice off its feet and then it starts biting the ice okay that is one example of instinct the other example instinct at play the other example of instinct at play perhaps is when uh, not perhaps but it definitely is when um, towards the um, towards the end when the the man loses all hope and he looks at the dog because he wants to kill the dog to rip out its belly and put its uh, put his hands in the belly of of, uh, the animal in order to warm his hand and when the man calls out to the dog the dog instinctually 
senses fear in the man's voice and it does not it does not willingly uh, go to the man so that is another example of instinct at play and um, so let's keep it at that okay and uh, so okay fine so let's keep it at this as of now okay so now there's another so now there's another individual in this uh, story it's the old timer at sulfur creek now this guy is an experienced old timer at, uh, at sulfur creek is the one who gives uh, the man advice he he talks about how the temperatures can really dip in the klondike region number one he also tells advices uh, the man not to travel all alone when the temperatures are below 50 in that particular region and he also advises the man on how to uh, on on the need on on the necessity of building a fire or having resources with him while traveling to build a fire because that is essential for human beings to survive so though he is uh, so though, so uh, every time that the, the first instance that the man builds the fire he thinks about the old man's advice okay and the old man also has a healthy a healthy respect for mother nature so he thinks about the old man's advice okay uh, and um, he, uh, he he kind of scoffs at the man old timer's advice uh, he 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 kind of he kind of looks perhaps looks down on the old man because he feels that the old timer the old timer at sulfur creek is just over cautious and the second instance that um, he kind of builds the fire uh, below the pine trees which is obviously a mistake when he gets his when he when he breaks through the ice and he, when he gets his feet wet the the reason why he builds the fire is because he remembers the advice of the old timer who had clearly told him that if one's feet sweat one has to dry one's feet otherwise that would spell disaster or that would spell uh, that would be very very risky and again uh, when he successfully builds the fire again he mocks the old timer by calling the old timer womanish and again the old the this particular the man the man the man the checker is uh, is 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 uh, very uh, his, he he feels that uh, if a man just keeps his head keeps his cool and calm in trying circumstances he'll be just fine okay and uh, so throughout the story and then again when uh, when 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 the when there's a cascade of snow that falls onto the fire and snuffs it out at that point of time is that 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 point is very dramatic and that's perhaps the turning point in the in the story where uh, where uh, we uh, 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 come to know okay just a sec uh, that is perhaps that is the turning point in the story where death turns its hourglass okay turns its hourglass okay and the race to build a fire begins and the, and there is this uh, okay so let's keep it at that so my point being this that every time that the, the first instance that he successfully builds the fire he remembers the old timer the second time uh, that he builds the fire he remembers uh, the old timer and then when he tries to so and then his uh, his subsequent unsuccessful attempts at building the fire he remembers uh, the advice of the old timer and finally at the end he concedes to the wisdom of the old timer okay so just remember that okay so now we also have the okay now let's keep it at this and there's another mention of the boys as well we'll get to that uh, later okay now let's so the characters done okay now let's look at the conflict now there are two conflicts out here one is external this is very easy to understand kids okay man versus nature man versus the forbidding uh, landscape and uh, temperatures of the Klondike region and you also have internal conflict internal conflict is basically conflict between the man's pride kids okay and the advice of the old timer and especially uh, the 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 instances when he uh, refuses when he can't quite build the fire because uh, his body refuses to listen to the commands given by his brain okay at that point in time he vacillates between two extremes so one is uh, so so one is uh, okay this this hope for survival okay and the other is this this certainty of death so so towards so in the latter half of the story okay we so so that is another internal conflict that the narrator reveals to us about the man okay so let's keep it at this as of now okay fine let's move on okay now look at the symbols 
okay so the man symbolizes rational judgment remember that okay what about the dog dog symbolizes instinct okay and the dog also symbolizes the dog too is a part of nature so nature in this particular story is indifferent to the man okay as we get to that part later but remember that the dog is not really bothered about the fate of the man the dog is not really bothered he does he's not concerned whether the man lives or dies uh, it doesn't really bother the dog okay and we have let's say the fire what is the fire symbolic of well the fire symbolizes life and protection from the extreme cold in that particular area life and fire is what makes the difference between life and death in that particular area and another thing about fire that you need to know is that fire in literature is also symbolic of knowledge so fire is something that only the man can build the dog cannot build fire and the man uses his knowledge and his resources like he uses his knowledge and he uses his resources like the match stick the birch kindling and all to build the fire okay so 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 the sapphire symbolizes uh, protection from the cold the fire symbolizes um, the knowledge of the man fire in a way is symbolic of technology as well and fire is what makes the difference between life and death in such and such such weather okay not weather uh, in, in such a landscape okay fine so let's look at the let's look at the boys now what do the boys represent okay remember he his his heading where he is heading to, towards this camp at henderson creek where according to him the boys his boys his his friends his companions will be waiting for him so the boys represent security the boys are symbolic of companionship okay the boys you could also say that the boys represent let's say sevi lai the boys represent civilization okay and the first instance itself okay so okay fine so i hope this much this part is clear and please forgive me for the speed <laughs> okay kids and i hope you kids are fine as well okay so you look at the main u portrait main uco trail so what is the main uco trail symbolic of kids the main uco trail symbolizes man man's conquest of nature okay and the main uco trail symbolizes let's say man's uh, man's uh, i will not use the word conquest but man's uh, let's say man's uh, um, okay fine conquest of nature for want of a better word kids not a problem and uh, the main tree also uh, symb symbolizes or the main tree uh, trail is also symbolic of what it's also symbolic of safety and security okay so do remember that and the the fact that he takes the detour he takes a side trail okay so that is symbolic of the element of risk side trail when he takes a detour it is symbolic of risk okay and the old man in a way is symbolic in this story what does the old man represent the old man represents a healthy respect for mother nature i've already spoken about this point okay fine so uh, this particular story is full of it's it's full of symbols uh, so you need to understand that okay so now let's move on kids okay so symbols done now let's look at naturalism so what exactly do you mean by naturalism well naturalism was kids it was a literary movement in the late 19th century okay and uh, i don't want to talk about it in detail though it's very very interesting uh, but uh, uh, 
Okay, so but I will, would just like to talk to you about the features of naturalism and the features of naturalism are very much evident in this particular story. That's why many teachers when they teach uh, this particular story to build a fire when you study, when you read and study to build a fire, you have to look at this particular story through the lens of naturalism. Okay, so what are the features of naturalism and how has Jack London used, uh, okay, how does Jack London write in the naturalistic tradition? Let's look at that. So I will look at it point wise. So naturalism, the first feature is, let's say it, it let's say keep it simple, looks at man from a scientific point of view. So two elements, okay, one is observation kids and this is an S observation and the detachment okay so so what, what exactly do I mean by this well it's very very what exactly do I mean by this kids it's very very simple well as in if you look at the story okay uh, uh, the uh, as in the writer it's uh, the writer himself Jack London uses a tone that is unemotionless it's basically uh, you take here he has taken a character okay who belongs to civilization because do remember that this particular man the man the chicka chicka co has come all the way there in search of what in search of gold and probably he's enterprising he's resourceful one could also say that he's enterprising resourceful in the sense uh, he actually chose to take a side uh, take the side trail because he wanted to gather logs of wood uh, perhaps in order to sell those logs of Wood. So throughout this entire story, uh, uh, okay, the narrator maintains a, a, a tone of detachment, uh, okay, and uh, the writing is very objective and the writing is very very repertorial. He just conveys just the basic facts of the story. Just the basic facts are con conveyed to us, and so this particular man has been placed in the experimental setup of this naturalistic story. Okay, so this particular uh, feature is met in this particular story. Okay, so the, ne so the next thing is uh, determinism. Now what exactly do we mean by determinism? Determinism entails, okay, so the first thing that you need to remember about determinism is that man's actions are influenced by what? Uh, heredity circumstances and environment but i don't want to talk about heredity right now i just want to talk about circumstances circumstances and the environment circumstances in the sense okay so this man i'm sure it, he belongs to the poor working class and that's the reason why he has come to this uh, unforgiving landscape in order to make a fortune Okay, so if he if he were uh, to be if he were affluent, he needn't uh, have come all the way in search of uh, uh, to try and make a fortune or in search of gold. And the environment, in the sense, obviously, uh, the natural the so determinism states that man's actions are influenced by the environment around him. Uh, okay, so do remember that. And obviously, in this particular story, man's actions, whatever he does, is governed and determined by the environment around him. Okay, another another facet, uh, another component of determinism is a lack of. Free will. Now, what exactly do you mean by lack of free will? Well, the naturalists believe that uh, this world is material and this is the only real world. Okay. And uh, in this uh, material, this particular material world is governed by a system of natural laws and man must submit, man must surrender. Man, surrender, okay, no, let's not use the word surrender, but man must submit to the forces of nature and uh, in and naturalists also feel that the, uh, that there is a okay so lack of free will so lack of free will in the sense okay this man feels that he has free will but if you read the story the readers come to realize you, you get a sense of how the man's idea of possessing free will is an illusion in that particular landscape okay so do remember that and there's another thing about 
Co about causality. Let's let, let's give the name causality. Causality is very very simple. Okay, it's like a chain reaction. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. So the reason why the man died. Remember the man died of hypothermia. Okay, uh, that's what it does. As, that's what cold temperatures do to the human body. So the man died of hypothermia. Why did he die of hypothermia? Now let's go in reverse gear. Why did he die of hypothermia? Because he failed to build a fire. Remember, he held the match sticks in between the heels of his hands and then his hands started burning he managed to light the fire but when he tried to remove the wet piece of moss he ended up uh, disturbing the nucleus or the core of the fire and uh, the, the fire got snuffed out okay why did that happen that happened because uh, okay he could not uh, he could not uh, quite uh, he could not like when he lit the match uh, match stick using his teeth okay the smoke entered his nostrils and he, ha he had to he cuffed out the match stick and th again the fire got snuffed out now why did that happen because he uh, he uh, he he Okay, and, and the reason why that happens is because he builds the fire, uh, this thing under a uh, spruce tree and there's a cascade of snow that falls on, onto the fire and the fire gets snuffed out. Okay, now why does that, that happen? Because he ends up wetting his feet. Now why does he end up wetting his feet? Because uh, but that's, uh, that's not really his fault but then he can't quite, okay fine. Why does he end up getting his, wetting his feet? So if you go back, the very fact that he decided to venture out on such a cold day, okay, uh, on a nine mile uh, trek okay so that was the starting point of 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 this this chain of events that leads to his demise or that leads to his death okay so remember that chain the thing of chain reaction okay and another thing is uh, 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 another feature of naturalism is the indifference of nature okay indifference of nature so if you look at this particular story nature is not malevolent okay nature is not has not targeted the man uh, in the sense uh, uh, if, even if uh, i were there or you were there or even if no one were there okay it would still be cold on that particular day in that particular area so nature is not really bothered about the fate of the man and this is something that one can see uh, in the dog as well who's not really bothered about the fate of the man so nature is uh, an indifferent disinterested force in this particular story okay so nature does not actively go on to assault the man so you just do remember this and there is an also sorry there's an also an uh, also Amorality. Now, what exactly do I mean by uh, amorality? In the sense, the narrator does not quite moralize about the about the actions of the man, whether it's right or wrong. Okay, so there's no moralizing element in this particular story. There is no sense of right or wrong. Okay, another feature. Another feature is, okay, most of the characters uh, of naturalistic stories belong to the lower socio-economic classes. So, okay, so they belong to the lower socio economic classes okay and this man obviously the very fact that he's come all the way to to that particular uh, uh, area clearly goes on to show, probably uh, uh, clearly goes on to show that he belonged to the lower socio economic class he was a working man okay and the other element or the other feature of naturalism is okay it it uh, naturalism uh, create situations or is interested in the deep conflicts that bring out the brute in man so uh, where is this feature in the story so the part where the man kind of loses all hope and he looks at the dog and he wants to kill the dog using its sheath knife okay that part uh, that is one part where the man kind of uh, morphs or be starts behaving like an animal because it's driven by 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 the need to survive so do remember that okay and uh, let's say man also is, is is treated in naturalistic stories okay as a biological creature now what exactly do i mean by this well 
in the latter half of the story kids okay when the man wants to do these simple simple tasks you can actually see and sense his fear but it's just that okay though his mind is telling to 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 do these tasks to undertake these these tasks but his body the anatomy of his body okay his physical as in as in the, the natural elements in his body it does not quite listen his body loses control okay his body does not quite 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 uh, uh, does not quite listen to to the commands given to it by by the brain of the man so uh, there are um, uh, there are elements so so man is basically a biological creature so that is something uh, so man's needs man's biological needs cannot be overshadowed by his uh, his, his 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 reason okay so one gets to see that feature of a nationalistic story in this particular story to build a fire as well there are a few more things i'll talk about that later when you kids come back and i am cross i hope I, I hope you i hope the situation does not persist for a long time and i i hope to see you kids soon so fine so i've spoken uh, in i've spoken about uh, nationalism now let's look at the themes well the themes are simple the first theme theme is let's say i've already spoken about it man versus nature i will not expand on it i think it's pretty uh, simple to understand the second theme is let's say in the Individualism. Individualism in the sense now there's another way of looking at the story is remember that America was uh, an, an unexplored frontier. So there were vast expanses of land where the where uh, people actually conquered the land and when they conquered the vast unforgiving huge landscape of America, okay. There was an element of risk involved. There was an element of danger involved. But despite that, uh, America was founded by, and the land itself was conquered by these enterprising, daring individuals who chose to break away with tradition, who chose to break away. And America is modern because America, uh, Americans, they, they value and have a reverence for individualism. They are all about individualism. So this particular man has faith in himself, his resources, his reasoning ability and he chooses to not to follow or not to listen to tradition and he chooses to venture out on his own uh, thus, thus perhaps and this is this is exactly how uh, how 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 uh, this is the value that americans uh, um, value this is this is a quality that the americans value a lot so the man is uh, an individual who is kind of pitted against the forces of nature uh, and the man is unafraid the man is enterprising the man is resourceful the man is competing and the most important thing is the man is has the ability to take risks so you can look at it like that as well okay so let's say man's uh, the, another theme is pride pride in the sense it's man's this man's overweening confidence and pride that leads to his fall okay now let's say you can also okay another important theme is the primacy of instinct okay so 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 in that particular situation it's the dog's instinct that held it in good stead that gave it the ability uh, to survive in that particular landscape and man's rational judgment uh, did not quite help him to survive in that particular harsh forbidding landscape so do remember that okay so uh, so so superiority again is subjective okay so in civilization yes man is superior to animals is superior to the dog but in 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 that situation in the experimental setup of a naturalistic story okay uh, jack london has clearly shown the primacy or the superiority of instinct as shown by the actions of the dog okay then okay so let's say uh, okay, fine. Uh, let's keep it at that. You can look at it in terms of uh, the one other theme could be is, uh, is survival. Another uh, theme is imagination. So uh, this story uh, has multiple themes in it. So just do remember that. Okay. So now, <laughs> what is the message? Well, the message is very, very simple. Uh, perhaps so. Though man is um, the lord of nature, remember, kids, man is also subject to it. Number one. Number two is. Uh, that uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, man should not venture out uh, in certain terrains, certain landscapes. Okay, that's another message. And uh, uh, and uh, 
the other message that I would like to talk about uh, in brief is that uh, if you look at the current situation at right now, uh, okay, man perhaps is 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 um, as in man is man perhaps has lost his and how I'm trying to bring out the relevance in this time and age. Man perhaps is is lost in an illusion of superiority. Okay. And a man has probably failed to, uh, we probably fail to understand that there are forces that overshadow uh, our paltry powers because of which, okay, illusion reigns and we've not been able to separate, okay, things from the significances. So that's why we have this air of superiority. So for all that you know, maybe life itself, our, our, our time on this planet itself is like a flash in the pan means uh, it's it's we, we are here but at some point in time uh, universe itself uh, nature itself will probably wipe us out okay so man needs to uh, to take that into cognizance and uh, man needs to understand that there are forces around him that overshadow his small puny nature and his supposedly superior powers Okay, having said that, uh, it was a bit, uh, I, I, uh, I, I was a bit quick, uh, but I hope you got the uh, gist of this particular story. And there are, a, there are, you got your workbook, you have a question in your workbook, please write down the answers out there. Um, bye bye kids and uh, see you, bye.